I think for a long time, um, a lot of people don't realize why they're doing what they're doing when they get back or um, why it's impacting them so heavily or why they feel the way they do or why they don't feel the way they think they should when they get home. So I think the biggest, biggest step about the first step is helping people with the insight piece and helping them to understand why they're having certain reactions. When a civilian enters any branch of the military, they go through a period of basic military training that's designed to change the way they think and act to turn them into a soldier, sailor, marine, airman, or coast guardsman. This is seen as an important time in the individual's life, critical for the proper transition from being someone not in the military to part of one of the greatest fighting forces on the planet. After a period of time in the military, however, there's little done in any branch of the service to help that service member transition their mindset to life as a veteran. As we often say here in the Change Your POV podcast network, after one leaves the military, they're never going to be a civilian again. And they're no longer a service member. They're this entirely different third thing, a veteran, with all the experiences, knowledge, strengths, and challenges that go along with that word. One of the most overlooked aspects of transition is a service member's mental health and wellness. If the veteran has their heart, mind, body, and spirit in the right place, and has a support network of family and friends to rely upon, then they're most likely going to have a successful transition. Those things are not in place. Things can get challenging. I'm your host, Dwayne France, and I'm going to take you through a veteran mental health boot camp to give you some advanced training for your brain. These episodes will cover the many different aspects of veteran mental health that I, as both a combat veteran and a clinical mental health counselor, see, experience, and support veterans with daily. I'm going to be joined by both veterans and mental health professionals talking about what you need to know about the stigma against seeking support, the different areas we need to understand, and provide some resources for when you think you might need them. Get up in the morning and out of the rack, because this is some information that could very well save your life. Welcome to Veteran Mental Health Boot Camp. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Headspace and Timing. Uh, once again, and as always, we really appreciate you taking the time uh, to listen. Uh, we know that uh, you have a lot of choices to listen to, and the fact that you're listening to us and trying to learn more about veteran mental health uh, is, uh, is pretty cool, and we really appreciate it. Uh, as you know, we're sort of in the middle of a series on, uh, on veteran mental health, uh, talking about veteran mental health not just with PTSD and TBI, uh, but uh, going even beyond that and what other concerns that veterans may face. And as you uh, heard uh, probably in the introductory episode, uh, we're kind of working our way around this conceptualization uh, of other things that veterans are concerned with. And so if you haven't uh, listened to that episode, definitely want to invite you to go back and and check that out, uh, episode 25. Uh, But today we're going to be talking about emotional dysregulation or, or challenges with the emotion that are really separate from PTSD. And, uh, and I'm really looking forward to having a great conversation with my guest, uh, Dr. Katie Bars, a, uh, a friend of mine, a colleague, a mentor. I think uh, Katie and I have known each other for uh, two going on three years. Uh, and so um, one, uh, one, one clinician among many that I highly, highly respect, um, but, uh, but one that I think we, we agree on a lot of stuff. So Katie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me today. Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, to start off, I'd like to um, 
let you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and sort of the work that you're doing? Sure, absolutely. So my name is Dr. Katie Bars. I'm a clinical psychologist. I studied at the University of Denver and spent about the first 10 years of my career working within the VA system. Um, I've worked in multiple different arenas in the VA system. I've worked in inpatient psychiatry, um, outpatient substance abuse programs, outpatient and inpatient PTSD programs. Um, and I also worked at the Vet Center for five years where I worked with combat veterans and veterans who had experienced military sexual trauma and their families. Um, and I did a lot of work with military sexual trauma in my position there. Since leaving the VA, I now currently work for the University of Denver. About a year and a half ago, we started um, the first military psychology doctoral program like this in the country where we're training psychology graduate students how to work with veteran service members and their families. Um, I started the program and I'm also the clinic director of our STERM Center, which is our off-campus community mental health clinic. Um, so we train graduate students how to be great therapists and how to be culturally competent working with this population. At the same time, we also provide direct services to veteran service members and their families. We can see veterans um, no matter what their discharge status is. We can see guard, we can see reserve, no matter activation status and any family member or supportive other. Um, we have gotten great response from the community. We've been, we've been open officially for about a year and a month. Um, we provide individual therapy, couples therapy, family therapy, child and adolescent therapy. And we provide um, veterans and family members with a lot of different types of assessments that can help them um, to better function and readjust in their community. So we can help them, for example, with disability assessments or learning disability, ADHD, diagnostic assessments that can help them to get reasonable accommodations at work, in the home, um, or to get the disability that they deserve. So those are some of the services we do. And uh, I've had the pleasure of getting to know Dwayne through that, and I look forward to our conversation today. Yeah, you're, you're not doing much. It's just a little bit of stuff that you're doing. It's a very wide range. <laughs> I, I have, a, I have a, 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 an affinity uh, for the program. I, I recall even some of the earliest conversations um, in the development of, of the STERM Center um, and the, the STERM Specialty in Military Psychology. And so, as you had said, you know, this is a program that is integrating cultural competence as a core component um, of its uh, of its program, rather than just uh, another course or a certificate or, or something like that. That's completely correct. Yes, there's four components. Um, we are exposing our students to research, so they get to do research um, in improving mental health services for veterans, service members, and their families. They get to do community outreach, um, community education. They do direct service, and they also under, go through a year-long series of courses on operational and military psychology and how to be effective clinicians working with this population. And, uh, and, and that's uh, Dr. Jacob Hyde, um, uh, your partner in that, and, and just getting on Absolutely. tape uh, because uh, Jacob and I have talked, and he is committed to coming on a future episode. So now that we've said it and it's going to be real, it's got to happen. So It's going to happen. <laughs> but uh, but but another aspect, and this is one thing for for Katie um, for the audience to to hear about Katie is when when veterans come to me and say that uh, I can only go see a clinician who's a veteran, um, or I can only that's the only way I can do it. Um, Doctor Bars, Katie is is one of the prime examples that I point to that that's not necessary. Uh, so you're 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 not a veteran yourself, although you have military family in your background. Yes, that's correct. Um, I grew up in a military family. Um, all three, and I have three grandpas. My parents are divorced, but I have three grandfathers. They all served in World War II. Um, my stepdad is a uh, retired Air Force, and so I grew up my whole childhood um, with a father in the Air Force, and then two of my sibling, siblings enlisted um, as we grew up. So the way I ended up serving was this way, but many members of my family served directly. So what was it about 
um, veteran mental health or military psychology uh, that got you interested in doing this, Katie? Well, at first, at first, it was a feeling that I wanted to give back. I wanted to be able to serve those who had served. Um, and it was really my way of serving. Um, and over time, as I got more and more clinical experience um, and got to know more and more veterans and service members and worked with them, it became so rewarding to see just the extreme resilience and strength and growth um, that veterans demonstrate. And yeah, it's difficult work sometimes, but what stands out to me more is the resilience. No, I, I absolutely agree. And I, I think that there's there's many things that, that you and I agree on, but uh, a lot of the clinicians that I talked to, maybe had, they hadn't served, that they, they found this to be uh, very rewarding, um, very, um, you know, very important work that, not that it surprised them, but uh, there was a depth to it that they hadn't considered. Sure, absolutely. There There's many depths to this work. I would agree with that. So uh, talking about, you know, we're, we're, we're going through this, um, this, this series on um, not just beyond PTSD and TBI, and we did talk about uh, PTSD and traumatic brain injury in episode 28 and 29, um, but, but I wanted to bring you on to talk about the emotional challenges that veterans face that are maybe separate from PTSD or TBI. Um, so uh, I guess I, to begin with, I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, yeah, you know, I, PTSD and TBI are extremely, extremely real for many veterans. You know, we deal with that every day here at the CERM Center. Um, that being said, there's a lot of other things that go on for veterans and service members and their families um, that people don't talk about as much. Um, so there's things like other types of anxiety panic that people may experience, um, dealing with numbness over time, um, their, you know, anger, feelings of helplessness, lots of different types of emotional changes that people can go through that you don't hear about as much in the media. And, and so in my experience, primarily I see um, uh, depression, um, yep. anxiety, and anger, um, you know, and lack of ability to control, and I call it emotional dysregulation, it is called. It's not just me. It's not something I made up. But, it, but it's the it's the lack of ability to regulate the emotions, um, and I think those are the primary three um, that uh, that I see in veterans a lot. Again, the anger, the the depression, and the anxiety. Uh, do you see that as well? Oh, I see that. Yes, all of the time. And we actually have a few statistics on that. Um, we know that about 10 to 15 percent of OIF, OEF veterans experience depression at some point after a deployment. We know that 37 percent of Vietnam veterans experience depression. We have stats that show that about 20 percent of OIF, OEF veterans experience anxiety and about 29 percent experience panic. So, yeah, it's definitely pretty prevalent. And, um, of course, with the new, um, you know, diagnostic and statistic manual, the, the new um, uh, way of looking at PTSD, there is an emotional component uh, to PTSD, um, you know, negative emotions and negative thoughts. Um, but those, that's, those emotional components arise out of being uh, exposed to or experiencing a traumatic event. Um, Correct. What about some of the other events in the military um, that could develop some of these statistics you were just talking about? Oh, goodness. I think there's so many different areas that could lead to, to anxiety and depression. Um, I'll talk about anxiety first. Um, I think, obviously, needing to be extremely alert in a combat zone, um, you know, really having a, a tendency towards survival surveillance almost all the time you are awake and sometimes even when you're asleep, um, that can really lead to some significant anxiety once one gets back into the civilian world because they may continue to utilize that level of surveillance or hypervigilance here when maybe it's not needed in certain environments and probably isn't needed in all environments. 
Um, and so that can lead to a certain amount of anxiety and agitation when people are out doing their thing in the community, um, engaging with life and that type of thing. Yeah, I think that is, uh, uh, and, and with a lot of these emotions, I see they were protective in one sense, uh, in one uh, environment, um, but they're not protective in another. Um, and, and that's exactly right. The, the, and hypervigilance, but always being on alert, always being aware um, and it not, not necessarily even being in combat. I've talked to uh, Cold War veterans, you know, who, who served in Germany in the mid-80s uh, um, who, who really experienced this kind of thing, always needing to be, you know, just the constant drills, always needing to be on your toes. You have an hour to, 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 to get this drill and that drill. Um, and, and just being aware is a normal military thing that you have to do. Um, and, and just operating at that level in a military environment, um, can kind of build that up. Anxiety is protective or alertness is protective, but when you're in a different environment, it just kind of, it doesn't work. I, I love that you said that. Um, that is one of the primary messages that I try to convey, convey to people when I am, um, talking to different organizations or other clinicians about working with veterans is that it's so very, very important for us to realize that a lot of these, I'm doing air quotes, problematic emotions or problematic behaviors were actually very adaptive behaviors in a combat zone. They were skills that were needed to survive and to thrive. Um, and so we need to recognize that when people come back home, that they're still doing those skills that worked for them there. It's just they don't work for them here as well. And so they have to learn different transitional skills. But we really, as a society, need to recognize that some of those things were helpful to them and really to our country as a whole. Sure. I, I think, and, and this is something that I think I was thinking about the other day, um, that especially in Europe, and I, I served two tours in Germany um, where this was always uh, operational security. They call it OPSEC, right? And OPSEC is, mm -hmm. you know, always vary your routes. Don't don't travel the same route to and from work, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and I think I realized um, the other day that, you know, I always take the same route to work. And that's a little uncomfortable for me because that's that's opposite of what I, you know, we're, we're always, it's ingrained in us, change your routine and things like that. Now, it's not something that I had so much angst around. It was more of an amusement thing that now I, I just travel the same road back and forth. But in the military, it's it's ingrained in us um, to do that in and with fewer people serving, um, less of the larger community is aware of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I think a lot of times what can happen with that is civilians or people that aren't aware of military culture can misinterpret those behaviors, and it can really cause more gaps in that military-civilian divide that we unfortunately experience so much. And so, and that's where I think a lot of the, the anxiety that can generate, but, but I think that also applies to anger as well. Um, and, and I use the yeah. same kind of argument yeah. as anger um, in that um, the, the anger, the aggression in combat, that was protective. Um, that was, that was, you know, you got slapped on the back and, and people, you know, you're, you're a who, you're a go-getter, you're, you know, you're all of these things. And so anger was, was an impetus for action and protective in combat. Uh, but the paradox is um, that it's really not protective when we get back here. Correct. Similarly to numbing. I mean, you 100% need to know how to numb your emotional feelings. Um, in a combat zone or in any type of traumatic experience, if you have just lost a buddy in a combat zone, you don't really have the time to stop and grieve that. And so numbing it and stuffing it is what you have to do to be able to complete your mission and to continue on um, with your mission that day and going forward. And so it's just that numbing doesn't work so well when people get back home um, and they're feeling disconnected at work or disconnected from loved ones or friends. Um, it makes it harder to connect with people um, when the numbing's going on. And really, it makes it harder to enjoy life. 
Right, and there's there's not the awareness too either that the shift needs to be made, and and I really appreciate how you brought that out because that's sort of the flip side um, that that I even personally experienced. I, I I've said often um, that uh, not that I went around make, you know poking the bear and making my my guys and gals angry, but but uh, definitely said you know I want you on your toes. I want you you know you got to be aggressive and keep your head on a swivel, um, but then. You know, I told him, I don't want you having, you know, don't take pictures in your helmet. You know, leave that stuff back at home. Don't, don't, I don't need you thinking about mama and baby and, and, yeah. and daddy and back home. You know, leave, and I, I called it fob love. Leave fob love on the fob. You know, leave it on the base. Don't bring it out here because I need your head in the game. And mm-hmm. so we, we allow anger to, to increase or aggressiveness to increase while in many ways I literally suppressed or, or discouraged um, these these emotions of safety or or, or concern, um, just in a general sense, and then when we come back here to to our family and to our communities, because it was there it was anger good, um, you know, uh, uh, concern and safety bad. Here it's anger right. bad and concern and safety good, and that's the paradox of veteran emotion is that what was beneficial for us there is harmful here. And what was harmful to us here is beneficial or harmful to us there is beneficial here. Right. Just like having no feelings on the com on a combat in a combat zone is good. There having no feelings here or being numb in your feelings doesn't work so well. And so how do you see, you know, veterans making that shift? Um, You know, and maybe it happens immediately. Maybe it happens you know, after a period of awareness, but, but how, how do you see veterans come to awareness about that? And then how do you see them make the change? Well, that's a good question. I think for a long time, um, a lot of people don't realize why they're doing what they're doing when they get back or um, why it's impacting them so heavily or why they feel the way they do or why they don't feel the way they think they should when they get home. So I think the biggest, biggest step about the first step is helping people with the insight piece and helping them to understand why they're having certain reactions. I always like to educate the veterans and service members I work with and their families actually about the concept of battle mind because the concept of battle mind outlines all the different skills that were needed in combat and how that actually plays out in civilian life. Um, I think it's really helpful because it teaches people and lets people appreciate how some of their behaviors that aren't working now really did work for them and really did keep them alive and protect them. So I think sometimes them being able to have some understanding of why they're doing what they're doing when they get home and also have some appreciation for how that helps them can give them some feelings of self-compassion at which point they can kind of begin to learn, okay, what skills do I actually need um, in my civilian environments, with my family, at work, at school, and so forth? What skills would help me now in this context? Because it's not really about what skills are bad or good. It's about what's helpful in what context. Could it also be about what what skills I can manage? You know, if there's a certain level of um, uh, keep hypervigilance, for example, and although hypervigilance is a component of PTSD, um, it's not in response to a traumatic event. It's something totally different. Um, for example, and, and you've uh, obviously been down here to Colorado Springs before um, visiting. Our, so one day, one day I was going to court. Uh, and uh, in one of our buildings up on the balcony, I just happened to, and I didn't even realize that I was doing it, that I was scanning the rooftops, and it just so happened there was somebody on the rooftop on this day, and I kind of did a double take, and even as I was walking across the street, I kind of had one eye, you know, on the person on the balcony. Now, I knew where I was, and this wasn't a flashback, and my, my heart rate didn't rise, but I still found myself keeping an eye but I can manage that right it's it's at least manageable and maybe it's something that I don't want to lose but it's it's something that I can control I yeah I like that you said that that's helpful and you know over time I've worked with a lot of veterans who have come in to work on PTSD um and 
a lot of them are police officers or correctional officers, um, or they work in certain dangerous jobs, and they better hold on to those skills of hypervigilance because mm -hmm. those are still serving them and helping them protect themselves in their current situation also. So it's not to say that these things are always a bad thing. They can be helpful. Hypervigilance can help in certain situations. And I, I often tell uh, the veterans that I work with is, 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 as you said, coming to an awareness or, or getting some insight around, around it, um, you know, if you want to go live in the bus in the woods and, and you're not hurting yourself, you're not breaking the law, you're not, you know, and your family is, is okay with it, as long as you understand why you're doing it and you consciously allow yourself to choose to continue to do that, then that's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just the way things are. But if you find yourself engaging these behaviors and they're causing problems in your life and, um, and you don't know why you're doing them, that's a problem. I would agree. If they're distressing to you or if they cause you to live your life inconsistently with what's important to you or, in, uh, or to your values, then I would say that's when it becomes problematic. So that's really, you know, of course, anxiety and anger, um, those were things that were protective to us at one point, but uh, sort of dysfunctional in our post-military lives. But depression arguably can't be put in that same boat. I mean, it's not like, you know, being sad or being depressed was protective at one point um, and, and is protective at another. It's, I, I think it's really in a different class. Yeah, that's interesting when you think about it that way. Mm -hmm. I would agree. So with depression, though, um, what do you think some of the causes of depression, separate from traumatic exposure, uh, what that could be from? Well, I think grief and loss can be a major one for people, whether they saw the death or whether it was considered a trauma, losing someone who's important to you can definitely lead to some feelings of depression. There's no doubt about that. Um, I think for a lot of people, if they experience um, some kind of medical problems or physical problems or change in functioning, that can be a result or that can cause depression also. Um, there's also this concept uh, called learned helplessness um, that Martin Seligman came up with where he talks a lot about how when people are in positions well, actually, when humans or animals are in positions um, and they're in a situation where they are enduring pain and they're unable to escape that situation, that over time they may begin to feel passive and they may begin to feel like they can't escape. Um, they may begin to shut down and to not move forward or to give up. And this can also lead to depression. Yeah, and, and this was, um, and I'll link uh, to, to that one, uh, the article that I wrote. This was actually the genesis of one of the first um, uh, parts of the conceptualization where I came from was that I was seeing learned helplessness as generating depression. Actually, when I read, um, first read Seligman's book, uh, Learned Optimism, where he talks through the process of discovering that, um, that I was like, I, I, I saw this completely. I saw this entirely. Um, in different aspects of my career, um, and and that it, it explained a lot more how maybe somebody who had never been to combat um, can still, you know, be become depressed or or, or have depression, um, it, just in the general kind of um, uh, uh, process of the military. So, uh, can you talk to us a little bit more about learned helplessness, kind of how? how it, it, it's generated, maybe some examples that, uh, that you've heard from veterans? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I worked with a veteran who had not gone to combat. He, um, he did not experience in any type of specific uh, criterion A trauma or impact trauma. But what he did experience in the military was chronic um, and very intimidating and terrifying racial discrimination. Yes. Um, and, you know, it wasn't just one event. It lasted for about three years. He grew up in a situation where he wasn't used to that. And then once he got in the military and experienced severe racism, um, he really talked about how over time he stopped asking for help from his command. 
Um, he wasn't sure why he was doing in the, the doing the work anymore. He felt like shutting down. Um, and even many, many years later, this is back in Vietnam era, but many, many years later, um, he still struggles with um, moving forward to do things that could help with help him with his health or help him uh, to file his disability claim. And so some of those early experiences have really continued to affect him throughout life um, and made it really difficult for him to act on things that might be able to help him because he doesn't expect the system to help him. And, and, and I was, as I was listening to that, uh, all the way up until the point where you had indicated what era the veteran had served with, it was almost as if you and I had served the same client because I had exactly the same situation uh, with the veteran that had uh, grown up in a, a very um, uh, permissive environment as far as a very inclusive uh, family was very open. Uh, and then he endured some of, in, in what I've heard, of some of the most significant systematic racial discrimination yeah. Um, and, and this was in 2013. So we're not talking about the 60s as in, I mean, this is something that as I was listening, there was a little bit of, of control on my part that I that there were non commissioned officers in the military that were engaging in such blatant and severe uh, racial discrimination in which as uh, the veteran that, that I was working with had come in primarily to to work on trauma because trauma was there and in our discussions we i recognized that this the in in toxic leadership but this environment was the primary cause for his anger and his his substance use um because he was had no other way to cope for people mm -hmm. with awol from this organization i mean this was it was systematic um in in you know Maybe even veterans listening will, will say, you know, how could this thing even still happen? But it does. It does. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, this in, in an in inescapable situation, no matter what I do, my actions um, cannot affect change. And so in, in Seligman's um, uh, um, experiments showed that sooner rather than later, the majority of of, of dogs and then later on with it with uh, with um, humans although they did do the same thing um, that they just gave up they just they just quit they just stopped and they started and they showed signs of depression absolutely so they, these dogs that you're talking about I think it's interesting to talk about that study for a little bit um, because it really just clarifies and illuminates what we're talking about here um, so his, his group of researchers, they took three groups of dogs. One dog, one group of dogs was strapped, and they were, they were all in a cage. So one group of dogs was strapped into harnesses for a period of time, and then they were released. So they were, they were uh, strapped down, then released. The second group of dogs was placed in harnesses, but while they were placed in harnesses, they were zapped with electrical shocks. But they could avoid those shocks as long as they press the lever with their noses. So they learned that there was an escape. Even if it was an unpleasant, unpleasant situation, there was an escape. The third group of dog received the same shocks as the dogs in group two, except they weren't able to stop the shocks from occurring and they weren't able to control the duration of the shock. The shocks were, the shocks were random and out of their control and they just had to take it. And so the next part of the study, um, the researchers um, set up a situation where the dogs could actually escape from the box or from the cage and the dogs in group one and two escaped um, and the groups and the ones in group three those were the ones that couldn't control the shocks they didn't even try to leave they just laid there just sat there and took it they just sat there and took it because they did not understand the concept that there was an option for them to avoid the stimuli or to escape. And, and that's in, in even describing that. And, and even as a caveat, these experiments were conducted in the 70s. Um, Correct. And they may not, much like uh, the Stanford prison experiment, would not pass a certain kind of <laughs> yes. uh, uh, evaluation today. But, but even yes. uh, Dr. Seligman and his team are very clear, and, and even in his book, he, he had concerns about whether or not this was, was ethical, um, but it was a breakthrough um, 
uh, moment on on not just the model of of depression, but farther along the model of resilience, because uh, Dr. Seligman saw that that there were some small portion of the dogs in that third group that no matter how random it was, they still were able to withstand that that sort of uh, depression and still get out. Um, and then they looked forward into what makes those dogs different than the other ones. And that's really where he had evolved into the concept of, of resilience, um, which Dr. Seligman uh, and Karen Rivich and, and their team at UPenn is now uh, had developed the Army's resilience training program. And so this is a genesis of, of not just depression and explaining why some choose to be depressed, but also why others um, experiencing the same situation have sort of a natural resilience. And then he, as a further, after the dogs who learned how to be helpless, once they were taught again that they could do something, uh, they could get out of it. And so resilience is a learned factor. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And and so and that's for me the the depression and and learned helplessness um it, it, that that can be so prevalent, you know, in, um in the military, even in even if we look at at combat zones, you know, being pinned down or um or being um you know on a base uh where we think some of the remote outposts where we just got there and we're like, you know, who in their right mind uh, would put a an outpost at the bottom of a bowl, you know. We're just asking, you know. So it's we're we're putting we're you know service members are put in these untenable, you know. I just got to sit here and and take it. I'm going to get punched in the face, kind of thing. Um, that that can wear down on a veteran over time. Absolutely, um, yeah, absolutely. That can wear down, and I think that that can lead to even more numbing over time. The other thing we haven't really mentioned, but I think is important to mention as we're talking about um, different areas of emotion dysregulation, is this whole idea of what adrenaline in a combat zone can do to someone over time. Sure. So I'm just thinking about, you know, a lot of what occurs in a combat zone requires an extreme amount of adrenaline. And, I mean, adrenaline can make us feel scared in some way, but it can also make us feel in control and that we can take care of a, a situation. It can make us feel strong. Um, and that type of feeling, for many people, is a lot more preferable to feeling depressed um, or feeling helpless. And so a lot of people, um, when they get back from combat, will engage in behaviors that can kind of keep that adrenaline level or jack that adrenaline level up higher so that they don't feel those lower feelings. Um, so you can see people kind of chasing um, things that are unsafe to do, maybe driving fast or using substances or using drugs or that type of thing to get back to that level of feeling strong and feeling like you have adrenaline and feeling in control. And and that can be difficult as you went back to people observing these behaviors in veterans or even clinicians observing these behaviors in veterans because another veteran could be driving fast because they simply don't care whether they live or die or using drugs <laughs> because, you know, uh, because they're, they're not concerned with their, their own health and welfare. Um, that to, to, you know, remove, not to chase the adrenaline. And so two of the behaviors or, or the, the, the behaviors could be the same, but the reasons beneath it, it takes a little bit more to understand why it's happening. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so sometimes it's about helping the veteran understand why they're engaging in that behavior, what, functi what function does that serve for them, and also thinking about, okay, you know, realistically, there's probably going to be few things in civilian life unless you're jumping off of, of trains or jumping off of bridges or something like that. There's going to be few things in civilian life that are going to give you that much of adrenaline rush. So helping people kind of accept that. And then sometimes they have to deal with some of feeling like civilian life is boring. Um, so now you've got that aspect to it, too. So it's helping people figure out well, how can I make meaning again? How can I enjoy my day? How can I enjoy what I'm doing and that type of thing? 
And, and that's something that, uh, you know, in, in, in you and I have talked um, uh, quite a few times about this conceptualization uh, of mind, too. And, and it's not as, as clearly delineated um, as everything is in its separate buckets um, in that uh, a different aspect of beyond PTSD and TBI um, is uh, the purpose and meaning. And, and we'll talk about that in the next, the upcoming episode, tomorrow's episode, um, with Dr. Aaron James Smith about the existential aspect, but without that purpose and meaning can lead to depression, um, and it can lead to these these sort of lower feelings. Absolutely, and anger. And anger, and that was the in how yeah. you had said the the adrenaline. You know, the veterans chase this adrenaline, but but how adrenaline um, in combat um, sort of was more acceptable and helped us be more in control. That's on the internal aspect, but many veterans um, know that it's better from an external viewpoint, it's better to be angry than it is to be fearful or sad. Uh, and right. so I, I had a mentor one time that, that explained it as, you know, all of our emotions are in this cabinet and they're all in its own separate bottle, um, but the bottle that has anger, it's shaken up and it's sprayed up all over the other emotions. Um, or the anger cork, you know, it's so anger is the acceptable, um, uh, uh, the acceptable emotion that when I feel depressed, I get angry. When I feel fearful, I get angry. Absolutely. And, um, I've run and facilitated multiple anger management groups and emotion regulation groups. And we've often talked about anger as being the blanket emotion, meaning that it kind of covers up all the other emotions underneath because a lot of times it is the air quote safer um, emotion for people to feel mm -hmm. so that there can oftentimes be feelings of helplessness or depression or grief under there or fear. And this is in both male and female veterans. I mean, absolutely. I mean, this is and, a, this... and civilians. Sure. Yeah. It's a, yeah. But, yeah. But, but that the anger is the, you know, but I've, I've, um, I've worked with, and, and you had mentioned uh, military sexual trauma, which, again, is a triggering event of, of post-traumatic stress disorder, definitely very clearly criterion A for PTSD, but also into that learned helplessness or someone that's experiencing chronic, um, in, you know, the elephant in the room, especially what's going on currently in 2017, um, the, the chronic sexual harassment leads into learned helplessness um, yeah. that, uh, that I can't escape the situation, but I've seen many, uh, women veterans and even male, ma uh, male veterans and male victims of MST respond with anger as opposed to depression or anxiety. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Or I've even heard on the news lately with all the, the sexual assaults and sexual harassment that has been made public lately. I've heard a lot of women talk about how they felt so empowered to speak up against what had happened to them and after for some of them after it was brushed under the rug later just the intense feelings of learned helplessness that occurred after that of you know i shouldn't have said anything and it, it is better for me just to shut down now right and and again and, and definitely not to um, diminish um, any amount of, of sexual uh, harassment or sexual assault uh, but male victims, with the stigma that comes against um, that, but male victims of MST are, are you know, grossly underreported because of the, the perceived stigma. Uh, and so they don't even get the empowerment of speaking out um, that it's, it's still that helplessness. That's very true. Yep. And, and so then anger becomes, and, and now we're back full circle to uh, anger being the prevalent emotion and anger being the... Um, you know, like you said, the blanket emotion, and it's the acceptable one. Uh, and then, of course, that leads into the other aspects of, of the model of, you know, broken relationships. And, and um, I just, I jab elbows and I, I keep people away from me and, you know, F the world and all of this other stuff. Um, not being able to control the anger leads to a lot of different challenges. Absolutely. You know, I'm sitting here thinking about all the different emotional experiences we've talked about today, and I'm realizing that we haven't really talked about guilt. True. No, we, we haven't. And, and that may be, 
you know, or, or some of it is in the realm of uh, moral injury, and not not to force the yeah. the conceptualization, but um, mm-hmm. in in uh, two days from now, uh, we'll release the episode with Dr. Joseph Courier um, about moral injury, and he and I talk about guilt there too. But guilt uh, is but- an emotional regulation, so I, I'd love to in in this context of how do we manage emotions. And in in, in in unregulated emotions, where do you think guilt fits in? Well, I think guilt can be covered up by many other types of emotions. I think a lot of people that feel guilty about things that they've done in combat or in general may shut down or may withdraw. They may feel that um, they don't deserve to be happy. And so they kind of stay in a chronic state of unhappiness. Um, they don't deserve to live a full life. This is what they might be telling themselves. So I could see how that in itself can lead to chronic depression. Um, I think guilt can also lead to a lot of anxiety. If you've done something that's not consistent with your values or your morals, that can lead to a lot of anxiety for people of trying to figure out how to resolve that. Yeah, I can see that, or or, or that um, I have this secret, and I hope no one finds out. And and it may be sure. something that's not even, um, you know, not even egregious, right? Or not even, you know, it, it's not war crime level stuff or anything else. But it's just this thing that I've, this secret that I've held so long that I just hope nobody finds out about me. Um, even when I've worked with male victims of military sexual trauma, I see that guilt for oh, yeah. for having it happen. Guilt, you know, the guilt that comes along with um, whatever it happened, and and you know, not not talking the specific, but you know, I didn't stop it, or I couldn't stop it, or I didn't want it, and, and it still happened. The guilt that comes around that, um, and. And and then yes, it leads into depression. Not that it, not again that we're trying to force it in that bucket, but it can lead to anxiety behind my secret coming out, or guilt, you know, and self condemnation, or shame, right? Shame, which can then play into all these other emotions. So I I think one thing I'm thinking about as we're talking is how intertwined all these emotions can become and how they kind of feed off of each other or lead to each other or that type of thing. And, and again, not something that a veteran or, or anybody, and, and these are definitely um, you know, conditions in which anyone, a civilian, uh, someone who had never served the military, for example, would, would have experienced if they grew up in a certain environment or endured certain um, you know, a systematic racism or, or, or things like that, um, that it can be very complicated um, and, it, and it takes a, a certain level of understanding about trying to, um, you know, where is this? Uh, you know, where did it come from? Why did it happen? Why did it, you know, why is it here and does it still need to be here? Uh, and I think that's where the mental health profession can really come along and help untangle this, this sort of knotted ball. Absolutely. Yeah. And you said the awareness and, you know, the insight around this stuff. I also think what another important component is the compassion, helping people to learn to have self-compassion for why am I feeling this way? And it's actually okay for me to feel this way, considering what I went through or considering my experience, helping people to actually learn to kind of appreciate some of those reactions as hard as that is to do that can be really healing for people to understand, hey, this stuff protected me in a way, maybe physically, but but also psychologically and emotionally. And it had a good function for a while. Maybe not now, but for a while it did. Yeah, I mean, it, it was there and, and it was there for a reason. I mean, it, it happened. And, and you know, I, I think I was talking, maybe it was, um, I don't recall one of the other podcasts that he, um, it was Justin Nasiri um, who had said that uh, we, we like being comfortable and sometimes we're just comfortable feeling like crap, right? You know, it's it's sure. easy just to sit there. I think he used to, he's like, I'm, I'm in the, the warm hot tub of just not doing anything. Um, yeah. And, and, and it's easy just to stay in bed all day and just, you know, binge watch on Netflix and not give a crap. And that's the comfortableness of it. And that's sort of that dip that we need to to one and not be coaxed out of but as you said to be encouraged um to say you know look it's okay um 
it's okay that this is happening. You're doing the best you can, and at the same time, you can do better. Mm-hmm. So what do you see really helps veterans kind of learn how to control and regulate their emotions, Katie? Well, I think we've talked about some of it. I would say insight. I would say something that's really important for people is learning and identifying what their core values are. I've said values a few times today, but that really helps people figure out what is important to me on a deep level. What are my priorities? Um, So, for example, if someone says, my primary value is my relationship with my family, um, then they can begin to modulate and regulate their behaviors based on whether their emotional outburst um, or emotional reactions are actually in line with with doing nice things for their family. So if a veteran says to me, and I've had veterans say to me, you know, I really stopped going off on people in the car or I stopped with my road rage behavior because I began to realize that it scared my daughter and that was not consistent with my value of keeping my daughter safe or having a positive relationship with my daughter. So if people know what their values are, they're much more likely to make conscious decisions about what to do with their emotions. And I, I like that. And there's there's different levels of awareness. First, becoming aware uh, that I'm scaring my daughter, um, and then becoming aware of the fact that I actually have control. Um, I tell veterans, awareness is fine, um, but change needs to come after awareness. So, uh, you know, I can right. become aware that I'm scaring my daughter, but if I say, oh, I don't care, well, the awareness just kind of sits there. It doesn't do anything. To really make change, we, we have to take action after, uh, after the awareness. Right. And uh, so after, you know, motivation is built through talking about values and helping people figure out why is it that I want to change this. And then people actually need to learn new skills. So they might have to practice grounding skills or taking a break or, you know, exercising or um, really any type of emotion regulation tool that can help them to not feel those feelings so strongly. We're not trying to get rid of feelings. That wouldn't be good either. But we're trying to help people learn how to manage those so they don't feel so overwhelming. Yes. uh, Or underwhelming. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, or yeah, or it just doesn't register at all. Um, I have found um, over, you know, since I've been working with the Veterans Court since 2014, probably the single most effective um, intervention whenever I, you know, if I go through my conceptualization for this, is uh, is dialectical behavior therapy. Um, yeah. And, and, and not in... And most people who are listening to this are not clinicians. There's different levels and types of it, but just the skills training. Uh, And so uh, DBT, uh, as it's called, um, it has uh, a component of learning to tolerate distress. There's times when we have to to tolerate the distress that we're in or we have to tolerate whatever distress is in our environment. The boss, you know, says something or the kids, you know, that distress in the car of the um, the guy cutting me off and the distress of me realizing I'm scaring my daughter. So learning how to tolerate that distress. Then there's the emotional regulation component, identifying emotions. What is this tangled mess? How do I control it? And then the interpersonal effectiveness of how do I manage uh, in between you know, uh, people. And then mindfulness component going through all that. So I found DBT is a really excellent tool specifically if the veteran is, 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 uh, is challenged with emotional regulation. Absolutely. We utilize that all the time at the STERM Center, and it's been very effective for people. Also, I think things like yoga. Sure. Um, can, yoga, um, being outdoors, um, doing things like that can also really help people to better regulate their emotions. There's, there's many ways, and I think it's part of our job as clinicians is helping people figure out what's going on for them and then helping them figure out the ways that are most effective for them to cope. And the ways aren't the same for everyone. So everyone kind of has to go along their own journey with that. And, and I, and I really like that you said that because a lot of these times, okay, so we can, 
we can remove the painful emotions. I don't want to say good, bad emotions, but the painful emotions, yeah. the, the less functional, those, those that are distressing us, we can remove those. But if we don't replace those emotions with positive, then there's not a level of wellness. We're not going to get above zero. We're just going to raise to zero and just kind of be flat. Um, but things like, um, you know, better physical health through yoga, um, you know, even more pleasant emotions um, in, in getting out, you know, whatever it is. We don't surf here in Colorado, of course. Um, but if surfing is the thing in California or Florida, uh, I guess it's a thing. I've heard it's a thing in Northeast, although I don't know why. But, but yes. Yeah, we so, have this thing called skiing here yes, in Colorado. Skiing and <laughs> snowboarding and, and hiking yes. and, and getting into the mountains. And, and those kind of things are, are full um full experiential you know so the smell of the pine and the feel of the breeze and, and everything else um that it is a a a fully immersive experience and, and so yeah so a lot of these things replacing the the unpleasant emotions with pleasant emotions can help us regulate the unpleasant emotions when they come in absolutely this is agree. uh this has really been great uh katie i i um I had ho high hopes whenever uh, we we agreed to uh, to come on to talk about this, and and you've exceeded them. I, I really appreciate um, uh, the time. Um, any last thoughts before we finish up? No, I don't think so. I really appreciate the time too. This was a wonderful conversation, and we'll drive on and keep working on this stuff. And. Yeah, I look forward to our next conversation. As, as so there will be there will be many. But if um, if if listeners want to hear more about you, the work you're doing, uh, the Sturm Center, how can they find out uh, about what you have going on? Yeah, we have um, a website. You can Google the Sturm Center, um, and it's spelled S T U R M. Um, the Sturm Family Foundation actually. Um, gave us the gift so that we could start this program. So we're very thankful to them. Um, so that's where our name comes from, but it's the Sturm Center. You can Google that, or you can also Google the Sturm Specialty in Military Psychology if you wanna learn more about our overarching academic program. But if you're interested in direct services, definitely give me a call at the Sturm Center and all that information is on our website. Um, our phone number here is 303-871. Eight seven one seven nine four two, and I'll make sure uh, all of those are in the show notes. Uh, and you're on Twitter as well, which is uh, great to see on social media. Um, there's there's not a lot of clinicians out on social media, uh, and, and you have a great team up there as far as outreach specialists and things like that too. And so, uh, we are fellow travelers on the path of trying to make veteran mental health a common topic of discussion. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. The old school in me immediately thought our, about our website, but didn't think about the fact that we have Facebook pages. Yeah, for I'll make sure. Specialty. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll make sure that it's all going to be on the show notes, and uh, and and I, I think that uh, all of those uh, the social media um, is is also linked to your website too. But uh, I just I really appreciate what uh, what you and the team. Uh, are doing. Um, and, and I think that we're really going to be making a difference. I agree. And I think us collaborating across communities will help many veterans. So that's our goal. And we'll keep doing that, Dwayne. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Have a well, wonderful day. Thank you. So you just got done listening to a great episode with Dr. Katie Bars talking about emotional dysregulation and how it applies to veteran mental health. You can find the show notes on this show and many of the things we talked about at either changerpov.com or veteranmentalhealth.com. Looking for episode HST031. This is the seventh episode of Veteran Mental Health Boot Camp, a series brought to you by the Change Your POV Podcast Network and the Headspace and Timing Podcast. If you're a veteran or service member, the family member of one, or support veterans in any way, then this series is designed to help you understand more about veteran mental health. If you're just
just now getting into the series, go back and check out episode HST025, where we introduce the concept of looking beyond PTSD and TBI in regards to veteran mental health. Make sure you subscribe to the Change Your POV podcast network on your podcast player of choice and sign up for updates at changeyourpov.com and veteranmentalhealth.com. We would love to hear your feedback regarding this series and all of the shows in the Change Your POV podcast network. You can do so by visiting our Facebook group, leaving a comment, or review on iTunes. Remember, veteran mental health and wellness is the basis of a successful post-military life and one that all who answered our nation's call to serve deserves. Remember, brothers and sisters, you're not alone, ever. That's what I say.